1941. The Germans were marching through Russia. They weren't just grabbing territory. They were also stealing priceless works of art. One of them was the Amber Room, an extraordinary series of 18th century amber screens worth millions of pounds. It was regarded as an eighth wonder of the world. This fabulous artifact was taken to the German city of Konigsberg. But four years later, when the Allies retook the city in 1945, the Amber Room had mysteriously disappeared. Was it destroyed in the fighting? Or had it been hidden? It was the beginning of a treasure hunt that would draw in some of the most powerful secret police forces in Eastern Europe. There would be searches, official and unofficial, sponsored by East Germany, by the Stasi, by the KGB. There would be false starts, missing records, and fabricated stories. The Stasi spent more and more money and more and more time because they wanted the glory. It would become one of the great treasure hunts of the 20th century, a hunt that continues today. We are very close to finding the Amber Room, but we just need help. The Ore Mountains in southeast Germany. An area of wooded hillsides and disused mines. Here, for the last 20 years, Henry Hattenhauer has been searching for an extraordinary missing artifact. It's a looted Russian treasure that disappeared at the end of World War II never to be seen again. Hattenhauer is convinced it's hidden in one of the region's derelict slate mines. We went to practically every mine in this county, no matter how old it was. I, I estimate that we have explored about 150 mines, more or less. Hattenhauer has kept a meticulous record of the search. It's so secretive, members of the team don't want to be identified. We even have our own surveyor team, if you're going to call it like that, drawing maps, measuring tunnels, measuring halls, everything. For his small group of treasure hunters, it's been painstaking and risky work. You cannot just walk in and, and open the tunnel where it is collapsed because it's extremely dangerous and you would need to secure yourself from falling stones. Yet after years of disappointment, Hattenhauer believes he has finally traced the missing treasure to one particular mine. If he's right, he could be on the brink of a monumental discovery. A 60-year search may be over. Hattenhauer may have found the legendary Amber Room. It was one of the most extraordinary artifacts ever created. The so-called Amber Room was a series of panels lining a palatial chamber. The old Amber Room must have been absolutely glorious. Would have been a wondrous sight. Nothing on that scale had been attempted before. Some of it was carved in three dimensions, crowns and things. What made it absolutely astonishing was the incredible quality of the workmanship. This figure, I'm, I'm not sure whether he's carved in one piece or not, one single piece, because the arm is a different color to the rest of the body. 
This extraordinary creation was built by 18th century German craftsmen using millions of pieces of amber. And in the back here, we have the mosaic, the background for the whole thing, where they have taken slices of amber and fitted them together so that they make this mosaic with no gaps. The whole thing is amber. Amber is a semi-precious substance only found in a few parts of the world. One of the main sources is the Baltic coast of Poland. It's formed from the resin of prehistoric trees that grew in the region 60 million years ago. During the early 1700s, the Amber Room became a symbol of German craftsmanship at its most magnificent. It was regarded as an eighth wonder of the world. And I think the reason for that is that no one had conceived of the idea of using amber architecturally. I mean, the sheer audacity of taking something which we normally associate with ornamental jewellery and using it architecturally to, to, to effectively coat or laminate an entire room was, uh, was foolish, incredible, uh, folly. In 1716, this extraordinary artefact was presented by the Germans to one of the most powerful emperors of Europe, Peter the Great of Russia. He took it to St. Petersburg, where it was installed in his summer palace on the city's outskirts. There it remained on display for over 150 years until the summer of 1941. In June that year, Hitler invaded Russia. The German forces weren't just interested in seizing territory. In a meticulously planned operation, they took with them teams of art experts intent on seizing anything that represented German craftsmanship. Hitler himself was a fanatic, fanatically searching for German artists of the 19th century, 18th century artwork. The Germans had a plan. Um, this plan goes back many years prior to the invasion um, when um, curators and cultural bureaucrats uh, were sent out with travel guides and they collated enormous lists of the treasures which would matter the most to the Third Reich. High on their hit list was the Amber Room. They figured that there was a tie-in on the Amber Room with the German heritage. They wanted the material back in Germany. For Nazis, the Amber Room represents uh, German power, a time machine that took them back to the idea of Teutonic Knights, these, um, these forebears of Nazism and National Socialism. It was, in short, symbolic a long history of German superiority and military might reaching back to the Middle Ages. As the Germans now swept through Russia, Soviet curators found themselves in a race against time. Thousands of precious artworks had to be packed up and shipped east as fast as possible to Siberia. But when they came to the Amber Room, they hit a problem. It seemed just too fragile to move. When the curators attempted to remove the amber from the backing boards, they discovered it would become completely brittle. It might have been possible to take it down without doing any damage, but it was a big risk. So instead, they decided to disguise the room as another room. 
Um, they got cigarette papers, which was pretty much all curators had in their pockets, and they stuck it over the amber. The idea being that the cigarette papers would act as a band-aid to stop the fragile amber cracking. On top of the cigarette papers, they put cotton wool, which actually they pulled from cushions. On top of that, they then put um, sheeting and then wallpaper. It was the best they could do. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. By September 1941, two months after the invasion of Russia, the Germans had surrounded St. Petersburg. Here they headed for the Summer Palace and its Amber Room. Despite Russian attempts to hide it, German looters knew exactly where to look. Consulting their um, ledgers and their plans, they have uh, an idea of which room to go to, they have an idea of its dimensions, and they even bring packing cases and were far more organised than the Russians who were called upon to evacuate it. The Germans shared none of the Russian fears about damaging it. They ripped all that amber out, and I'm sure they numbered it properly, and put it in big chests and shipped it out. Within days, the Amber Room was on its way from St. Petersburg to the German city of Konigsberg, known today as Kaliningrad. Here it was installed in the city's castle museum. This would be the last known resting place of the Amber Room. What happened to it next would be murky and controversial. By the winter of 1944-1945, the Germans were in retreat. Allied planes bombed the German defences at Kaliningrad. The Red Army swept west. By April 1945, they'd retaken the city. By the time the Red Army arrived, the, the city is on fire. Um, its people are cowed and living in terror. And every Red Army soldier who arrived at this locus for Nazism wanted to destroy a bit of it. One of the first things the Russians did was search for the Amber Room. But as they scoured the city, it was nowhere to be found. What had happened? Had it been destroyed in the battle for the city? Had it been hidden somewhere? Or had the retreating Germans taken it with them? And if so, where? The mystery of the Amber Room had begun. Spring 1946, and the Soviet Union sent teams of art experts to comb the rubble of Europe for the country's looted treasures. The Soviets had trophy brigades that went through and stripped every museum of every country they occupied. One place they headed for was Kaliningrad the last known resting place of the Amber Room. The mission was led by one of the country's leading art experts, 
Anatoly Kuchimov had been the chief curator of the Amber Room in the years before the war. In Kaliningrad, he soon found a highly significant clue. The Amber Room had contained four small stone mosaics. Sifting among the debris of the castle, he found fragments from three of them. The three, as it happened, were brittle, fire damaged, and when you touched them, they disintegrated, but the fourth was missing. Kuchimov couldn't even find fragments from the fourth mosaic. It must have been removed. To Kuchimov, this was highly significant. If one of these panels could be missing, what else from the room was missing? This is the logic of Kuchimov. If the panel had been taken, the far more valuable amber walls, the amber facings, must have been taken too. And in his opinion, there is a clear case to be made that the amber room survived the siege of Königsberg. But if it had survived, where was it? Kuchimov's inquiries took him back to the closing days of the war. Reports suggested that as Allied bombs fell, the Amber Room was hidden below ground. Was this where he needed to look? Kuchimov manages to uh, get some digging equipment and, uh, and a team of volunteers, and they begin uh, their own excavation. He worked incredibly hard over a very short space of time. They had divers diving into booby-trapped and flooded tunnels, many of whom were died as the tunnels were electrified by the Nazis before they left and left with explosives in them. The Russians even blasted their way through collapsed tunnels. He broke through the foundations of various buildings to discover underground bunkers. He drained um, flooded cellars. He broke into um, stores um, in various castles that ringed the city. But he could find nothing. The search for the Amber Room would become one of the great treasure hunts of the last half century. One of the first countries to join the hunt was the newly formed Republic of East Germany, the GDR. This eastern part of Germany had been occupied by the Red Army in the closing months of the war and was now part of the Soviet Eastern Bloc. It would become a key defender of communism in Europe. And to make sure there was no internal opposition, the authorities created a highly efficient secret police the so-called Stasi. The Stasi were housed in a large office block in Berlin. Here they gathered information on millions of East German citizens. In the late 1940s, as the Stasi got wind of the missing Amber Room, they embarked on their own search for it. The GDR was very, very keen uh, to look good in the eyes of Moscow. The communists in East Germany had a guilt complex about invading the first socialist country, the first communist country in the world. And many of them thought they should do something uh, which would assuage that guilt. So therefore, when the Soviets wanted to find the Amber Room, it was natural for the GDR to say, yes, we will help you. Yet the Stasi weren't the only secret police force looking for the Amber Room. In Moscow, the Russians turned for help to the KGB, based at the infamous Lubyanka.
For the next 30 years, both the Russian and East German secret police would run separate searches for the Amber Room. There's two secret investigations running in parallel, one being driven by the KGB and one being driven in East Germany by its fraternal uh, compatriots of the Stasi. But the search was neither very fraternal nor cooperative. If the KGB thought that it was on the track uh, of the uh, Amber Room, uh, it would not reveal that to the Stasi uh, because they wanted the glory. And of course, the Stasi, uh, they wanted to be the first to discover uh, where the Amber Room was, because they wanted the glory. So therefore, you had this uh, slightly strained relationship. The KGB would concentrate its search at the last known home of the Amber Room, Kaliningrad, the former German city of Königsberg. Meanwhile, the Germans began their search closer to home. In Berlin, the Stasi's first clue came from a former Nazi officer. Gerhard Strauss had been an assistant curator at Kaliningrad Castle, where the Amber Room was on display. He explained that as Allied bombs fell and the Red Army edged ever closer to the city, he'd picked up rumors the Amber Room had been spirited to safety. Strauss had got hold of various papers and talked to uh, the curator of the Amber Room and in his mind there had been several key locations for where the Amber Room may be, one of which was Görlitz. Görlitz is a small German town which sits astride the German-Polish border. For a brief moment it looked as though the Germans had made a breakthrough. But as they looked further at Strauss's evidence, it was clearly based on little more than hearsay. Not enough to turn a city upside down. What they needed was something much firmer. But with no more clues to go on, it was time to try something new. In 1958, the Stasi did something unprecedented in the tightly regimented society of East Germany. A regime notorious for its secrecy went public. In an article in the East German newspaper, Frei Welt, it made a public appeal for help. An appeal goes out. There are clues that lie with ordinary everyday people and that now is the time for those clues to be gathered together in order that the search can reach critical mass. If you know anything, contact your local city council, contact the newspapers, contact the KGB, contact the Stasi, contact whoever you want, but now you help us as loyal citizens to rejuvenate this search. The German investigation was now led by a Stasi agent called Paul Enke. Paul Enke was a uh, Nazi, a member of the Hitler Youth, captured by the Soviets and shipped off for re-education. Um, re-education which he embraced wholeheartedly and then um, as surely as he'd been a member of the Hitler Youth, he became a colonel in the Stasi, a fully paid up member of the secret police. Within weeks of the article appearing, Enko received a letter. It came from a man with a remarkable story to tell. The man, known by the codename Rudy Ringel, told Enka he'd been digging through rubble in the basement of the family home. Here, he'd found his dead father's identity papers, together with a package of documents. Ringel had read them 
and been terrified. His father had been a member of the SS, Hitler's personal elite military force. In 1950s East Germany, such connections could mean serious trouble. The young Ringel had burnt the documents and tried to forget the whole incident. Now, 10 years later, the article in Freiwelt had reawoken the memory. Ringel told Enker the now destroyed documents had included a receipt confirming the handing over of 42 crates and an order to take them to a secret location. Most importantly, he remembered the transcript of a radio message. Action Amber Group concluded. Storage of the SCH. Access blown up. Casualties through enemy action. Anker could hardly believe his luck. Here was the first positive confirmation that somebody had ordered the evacuation of the Amber Room and that the job had been completed. Anker now had solid evidence the Amber Room still existed. It had to be possible to find it. Digging further through Nazi files, Enka found documents suggesting the radio message had been sent from a small mining town in the Erzgebirge Mountains. The town was called Lengfeld. There were now three potential hiding places for the Amber Room. The Russians still believed it was hidden somewhere in Kaliningrad. German investigations had initially identified somewhere near the Polish border town of Gerlitz. Now they suggested it might actually be near the German town of Lengfeld. But Lengfeld is surrounded by hills and valleys. There were hundreds of potential hiding places. The evidence was much too vague. Enka needed something more concrete. Then, in the 1960s, there appeared to be another breakthrough. It came from the parallel investigation in Russia. For some time, the KGB had been interrogating a man called Eric Koch. Koch had been an important Nazi official. Throughout the war, he'd been the Gauleiter, or boss, of Kaliningrad. He'd been the man responsible for installing the Amber Room in the Castle Museum. Now, in 1967, he finally admitted to the Russian KGB that during the closing days of the war, he'd ordered it taken down. He at last concedes that the Amber Room was part of a list of treasures that was to be packed up and evacuated. And in fact, because the evacuation couldn't succeed, he claims instead it was placed in crates and buried in a secret bunker beneath a church in Kaliningrad. Here was new hard evidence to back up the Russian curator Anatoly Kuchimov's theory that the Amber Room was not in the German Erzgebirge. It was still in Kaliningrad. This evidence um, is leapt upon by um, the Soviets, who immediately requisition heavy digging equipment and volunteers, and they set out to turn the entire city upside down again. Once again, the Russians scoured Kaliningrad. But once again, they found nothing. If the Amber Room really was in the city, its hiding place remained a mystery. Mm. 
Meanwhile, back in East Germany, Paul Enker was still trying to firm up the evidence he had gathered. For eight years, he'd drawn a blank. Then, in 1976, in the city of Weimar, Enker found records of Koch's personal hoard of looted art. Koch had been a major looter of Soviet artworks. The record suggested the hoard included 132 silver candelabra. The number was highly significant. It was exactly the same number of candelabra as had been in the Amber Room. Were they one and the same? Enker interviewed local people in Weimar. He gradually uncovered a new trail that suggested Koch had been lying to the KGB. One of the compelling stories that he reports on is uh, an ambulance in which crates were loaded and that certain uh, unknown but mysterious and incredibly valuable treasures under the auspices of the Red Cross, i.e. a neutral vehicle, a vehicle that wouldn't be attacked either by air or on the ground, fled Weimar carrying these treasures. The record showed they had taken the treasure south to the Erzgeberger Mountains. If Enker was right, the Amber Room wasn't in Kaliningrad at all. The bits of the jigsaw were coming together. Rudy Ringel's evidence had also pointed to the Erzgeberger. Enker was now convinced he finally knew just where to look for the Amber Room. That year, Enker started searching disused mines in the region. They begin zeroing in on a series of mines, and they brought in heavy digging equipment. And they dig, and they spend considerable amounts of, of money on this operation. It's a vast operation involving huge numbers of volunteers. Enker narrowed the search to one mine. But the shaft was blocked by rock falls. The Germans dug hard. They blasted through blockages. But Enker was in for a nasty surprise. When they break through, eventually, to um, the areas they have mapped out as the key locations, what they discover, rather than treasure, is rolled up and burnt pieces of Pravda. Pravda was the Russian Communist Party newspaper. The burnt pages were dated July 1945. They'd been used by the Red Army to roll cigarettes. The Soviet forces had already explored the mine 31 years earlier, and they'd clearly not found the Amber Room. But nobody had bothered to tell Enka or his German colleagues. The operation had cost the Stasi some half a million dollars. It had been an expensive and embarrassing failure. Back at headquarters, Enker's bosses ordered an investigation into what had gone wrong. The Stasi were not used to failure. They also made a second alarming discovery. Rudy Ringel's story that his father had been a major in the SS was a complete fabrication. The man that Paul Anker had built his entire case on was in fact a wounded postman who had no connection to the Amber Room story, a fantasist, with forged documents, the German connection to the Amber Room was fallacious and a fantasy.
Yet incredibly, despite even this setback, the Stasi spent the next 10 years continuing to look for the Amber Room. Once the Stasi had started on the operation, they didn't give up. There was no concept of cost effectiveness. It was the objective which was important. And therefore, they would spend more and more money and more and more time, even though the end result may have been very, very meager, even though the, the chances of finding the Amber Room were very, very small. That didn't matter. In a communist system, you just kept on looking. In fact, the search would only end when something much bigger changed the entire world. Nineteen eighty nine. The wall dividing East and West Germany came down. Communism in Eastern Europe collapsed. East and West Germany were reunited. In the following euphoria, a German energy company agreed to sponsor the construction of a brand new Amber Room and give it to the Russians. It would be a massive undertaking. For a start, the art of amber carving had been virtually lost. They had craftsmen, but not the craftsmen that they'd had in times past. People hadn't been carving amber in that way for so long. The workmen had almost nothing to go on. They didn't know exactly how the room had been made. They had no color photographs of it. They had to work out how thick the mosaics were. They had to work out how big the carvings were. They tried making panels and discarded them. Some of them, they decided, were simply wrong. And of course, the big problem was the color. This was a problem nobody had anticipated. New amber tends to be sort of bright. If they just put Baltic amber untreated on the walls, the whole room would have looked lemon yellow. It would have been completely wrong. So they took one or two of the old caskets that they had from that time that would have aged in the same way and they photographed them in black and white. Then they compared those black and white photographs with the black and white photographs they already had of the old amber room. And from that, they worked out this gray is that tone on the casket, so a matching one would be that on the wall. And that's how they reconstructed it. Whether or not it's completely correct, of course, we don't know. The work took several years. Finally, in 2002, amongst much pomp and circumstance, it was erected at its former home in the Summer Palace outside St. Petersburg. It may not have been the original, but it was still a spectacular sight. But despite this success, it left a big outstanding question. What had happened to the original Amber Room? In 2004, Adrian Levy was one of two investigative journalists to publish the results of a four-year trawl through reports, letters, and documents in Berlin, Moscow, and St. Petersburg. The investigation had taken him back to 1945 and the months just after the war. Here, he'd found a new clue. 
That summer, the Russians had dispatched a high-powered art expert to Konigsberg to look for the Amber Room. Yet the visit had gone almost unrecorded. His name was Alexander Brushov, a professor at the State Historical Museum in Moscow. What staggered Brusov um, when he turned up in Königsberg was that there had been no attempt to secure the ruins of uh, Königsberg Castle, to ring it, place a perimeter around it, to protect treasures that were being stored in it. Slowly, Brusov had pieced together a chronology of events. Up until um, the surrender of Königsberg, the castle was intact. And yet, between the surrender in mid-April, the occupation by the end of May when he arrives, the castle was torched. The big question was, had the Amber Room gone up with the castle? And if so, who had been responsible? Brushoff reached an uncomfortable conclusion. He noted on his report and in his private diary that the torching was the responsibility of the Red Army, who saw the castle as the epitome of Nazism, of everything that they despised, without thinking of what might be stored in the cellars. One item of which was the most precious treasure of all, the Amber Room. So the Russians themselves had destroyed the Amber Room. It had been a spectacular and embarrassing own goal. Brushoff had solved the mystery in 1945. So why had the truth been kept a secret? Why had the Russians claimed it still existed? For Levy, the answer was simple. The thought that the Red Army had carelessly destroyed one of the country's most important artworks was not a notion the Soviet authorities could accept. So instead, they'd fabricated a new truth. The myth that the Amber Room had been saved but hidden was born. Moreover, Levy discovered that in sending Anatoly Kuchimov to Kaliningrad, the Russians had found just the man to spin the yarn. Ever since the German invasion, Kuchimov had been a troubled man. In 1941, he'd been personally responsible for the artworks at the Summer Palace, including the Amber Room. It was he who decided it was too brittle to move. It had been his decision to leave it where it was and paper over it. But the Germans had shown that he was completely wrong and had carried it away in a matter of days. Anatoly Kuchumov came back after the war racked by this decision, racked by guilt. So here we have a young curator, an ambitious young man, who's made a fateful decision that turned out to be the wrong decision. He didn't pack the Amber Room, but the Nazis stripped it in 36 hours. In the post-war political climate, responsibility for such a disaster could mean arrest and even death. He's come back into a heavily politicised environment at the beginnings of a Cold War, where the KGB dominate and guilt is being apportioned. Other colleagues are disappearing as a result of those decisions. Is the man who is responsible for the vanishing of the Amber Room going to come back saying he found nothing? That's not going to happen. So instead, Kuchimov had come up with a new answer, one more favourable to Russia and himself. It had probably saved his life. Kuchimov's verdict when he was sent there in 46, was there was enough evidence to suggest the Amber Room survived, which meant that he could also therefore provide the evidence that he himself was not guilty of anything. No crime had been committed. The Amber Room had not been lost. Mm -hmm. 
Levy had finally got to the bottom of the mystery. The search for the Amber Room had gone nowhere because it had been destroyed. But that hasn't stopped some people continuing to look for it. In the early 2000s, treasure hunter Helmut Gensel led a search for the Amber Room in the Czech Republic, close to the German border. He claimed to have picked up rumors that heavy lorries had transported the Amber Room to a disused silver mine as the war was ending. Why, at the last days of the war, all these trucks would come here? There must be a reason. Meanwhile, across the border in Germany, where the mine has a second entrance, the local mayor also began digging. The measuring instruments showed some hollow space and metal objects. We want to check it now by drilling. Neither hunt has ever found anything. But one man is still hopeful. Deep in the Ore Mountains, Henry Hattenhauer is still chasing his dream of discovering the Amber Room. He's found a mine he believes may contain important new evidence. We found footprints from SS boots. A lot of footprints, all pointing to this one place in the mine. We found a lampshade with five light bulbs, which is very unusual. Electrical fittings are never found in these mines. They were closed in the 19th century, before the use of electric lighting. To Hattenhauer, it suggests the mine has been used much more recently. It was definitely not just used as an ordinary mine. Personally, I'm convinced that the Amber Room is here. I'm absolutely convinced. I mean, I'm not, I know that there are many people claiming to know where the Amber Room is and people laugh about it. But we really have a lot of interesting hints that make us think that the Amber Room is here. Just beyond the footprints and the mysterious lights, the mine shaft is blocked by a rock fall. It would cost thousands of pounds to clear it. Money Hattenhauer and his group don't have. We, we are very close uh, of finding the Amber Room, but we just need help. We can't do it ourselves. So far, Hattenhauer has failed to find a backer. But he's not giving up hope. Such is the value and mythic status of the Amber Room. It will continue to exert a magnetic pull over treasure hunters. Even though all the evidence suggests it was destroyed more than 60 years ago.